Good morning and welcome to our worship at Grace Church on the Hill in Toronto on this beautiful Sunday morning, June the 6th, when we worship according to the order of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us and write both these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you have assured the human family of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The epistle is written in the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians in the fourth chapter, beginning in the 13th verse. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Here endeth the epistle. And 38, found in the prayer book, page 508. Psalm 138. I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. Even before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name because of thy loving kindness and truth. For thou hast magnified thy name and thy word above all things. When I called upon thee, thou heardest me and endurest my soul with much strength. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, for they have heard the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. As for the proud, he beholdeth them afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, yet shalt thou refresh me. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hand upon the fury of my enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. 
the Lord shall fulfill his purpose toward me. Yea, thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not, then, the works of thine own hands. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The Holy Gospel is written in the third chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, beginning at the 20th verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. The crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain Jesus, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him, a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as I've been going on walks throughout my neighborhood, I've seen confirmation of something I first read about in the news. Home renovation is at an all-time high. It's hard to go a block without seeing a building permit in a window or a paint tarp on a lawn a dumpster in the street. Everywhere you go, there are signs that people are renewing the spaces that this past year we've spent so much time in. And of course, it's not just homes. Our own narthex and courtyard renewal projects kicked off this week. Everywhere around Toronto, we have indications of the life that will greet us on the other side in the renovations that are taking place. And who can blame us? After all the time we've spent indoors this past year, I think it's understandable. A crack in the paint that might have gone unnoticed for years becomes unbearable when it greets you above your computer screen every morning. And when day after day feels so similar, I think it's little wonder that we try to alter the spaces we're in to make up for the sameness. Well, I think St. Paul would be familiar, maybe even sympathetic with this impulse. When he wasn't preaching or teaching or writing letters like this one, he was making tents. Not quite a home renovator, but he was familiar with what went into making a, a place of residence feel livable, even if that place of residence, a tent, was temporary. Of course, in the long term, every residence is temporary, and that's what he wants to tell the Christians at Corinth. He uses domestic language to talk about the body. Like a tent, 
the skin we live in eventually wears out. Our bodies are only temporary dwellings. Well, Paul knew better than most what he was talking about. Later on in the letter, he chronicles all the things that have happened to him and his body in the past few years. They include multiple, multiple floggings, more than one shipwreck, and at least one stoning. Well, my own list of bodily discomfort and pain would be quite a bit shorter and fortunately less dramatic than St. Paul's, but I think his point stands. The bruises, the aches and pains that we experience all point to the fact that one day our bodies give out. No matter what renovations we undergo, our skin won't last forever. An exercise regimen or a diet or a medical procedure can put us in better shape, but they won't make us last forever. Now some people in St. Paul's day and in our own see this as a good thing. Some people think it's better not to be a body with all the embarrassments and inconveniences that that brings. But I don't think St. Paul would agree. For him, bodily life is a good thing and its end is tragic. I believe in the resurrection of the body, we say in the Creed. And though, of course, the Creed wasn't around when St. Paul was writing, it's passages like this one that cause Christians to come up with that phrase. So Paul sees the body a little bit differently than perhaps he's sometimes thought to, and also differently than some of his contemporaries and some of ours sometimes do. But I think there's another way in which St. Paul sees the body differently, and it's on this difference that I like to focus, because I think it presents a challenge to us in our own day. He's already said that the body points toward death, but it also points beyond itself. Our bodies are not only signs of death. Even in their weakness and fragility, St. Paul says they point to the life of God. What might he mean by this? The image that comes to mind is the one I opened with, a home. But maybe a home in need of quite a bit of renovation. The paint is chipping on the walls. There's a crack in the window. But imagine that as you walk past this house, you see a smiling face in the window, maybe hear some children laughing. There's bread baking in the oven. The exterior of the house gives no indication of the life that's inside it, and yet it's there all the same. It's the same with our bodies, St. Paul says. Broken or breaking down, there's still a light within them that doesn't come from them. A hint of the renewing power of God is present. And this light is still there, whatever capacities or achievements or possibilities we have or fail to have. Well, I think this picture of the body challenges conventional pictures in two ways. First, I think it challenges us to expand who we see as human, what we picture when we think of that word. To take one example, Despite a recent push for a broader expression of human bodies in fashion and advertising, the range of bodies that are depicted is still embarrassingly narrow. It's clear that we're uncomfortable with some kinds of bodies, ones that deviate from certain standards we have. People who are sick, the very young and the very old, people whose intellectual and physical capacities are different than our own. These people are largely invisible, and I think that invisibility reveals a failure to imagine humanity in its fullness. The discovery of the bodies of 215 children at the Kamloops Residential School speaks to generations past failure to imagine humanity in its fullness. They were perceived as aberrations, 
and they were treated in the same way. Their bodies and their persons were treated with impunity. No doubt we'll continue to reckon with that failure in time to come. And no doubt there's also some reckoning to be done in the present with our own rather narrow view of who a human being is. So Paul's picture is a challenge to how we perceive other people. But I think it's also a challenge to picture again the way we perceive ourselves. The relation of our lives to our bodies is sometimes talked about in terms of a property owner with their property or a state with the territory that it governs. But if God's light shines within me, then my body is more than simply a possession. There's a meaning to me that I can only learn from other people. The light they see in me is often hidden from my own eyes. So what I do with my body, how I live my life, isn't simply up to me. I belong to others as they belong to me. We're tied together in mutual care and responsibility. And I think that entails both the joy of being surprised by others and also the pain of sometimes realizing that I'm not exactly who I thought I was. So Paul's picture of human beings challenges both how we see others and how we see ourselves. On the one hand, it's a challenge to widen the range of where we expect to see an image of God. And on the other hand, it's a challenge to open ourselves up to be seen by others and to be told who we really are. I think the life of some communities helps make sense of what happens when these challenges are taken seriously, when they're put into practice. I'm sure many of you are familiar with L'Arche Daybreak here in Toronto and with Henry Nouwen, the Catholic priest who wrote about his experience living with people with disabilities. His last book is called Adam, God's Beloved, and it tells the story of living with a man named Adam, a man unable to speak and prone to frequent seizures. Their time together now and says, announce to him the marvelous mystery of our God, a mystery which has nothing to do with whether or not Adam could speak, walk, or express himself, whether or not he made money, had a job, was fashionable, famous, married, or single. It had to do with his being. Nowen's life with Adam widened his understanding of what a human being is. And it also caused himself to understand himself in a new way. His own skills and accomplishments, he found, began to matter less and less in his own perception of himself. And at the same time, his innate human dignity began to matter more and more. Living with Adam also taught Nowen to see the person of Jesus in a different and fresh light. He came to see that the love of God wasn't made known in Jesus so much in what he did, but in what was done to him, in what he suffered for the sake of others. The light of the world shone in that broken body, and it shines also in our bodies, as St. Paul says. To return to his metaphor, whatever the exterior appearance of this tent, this body, there's still a hint of God's life apparent in every human life. To learn to see that light in ourselves and in others requires perhaps a different kind of renovation, a renovation of our hearts. And that's the hard work of learning to see as God sees, each person accepted and approved despite the things we do and fail to do. Amen.
believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. After each petition, I invite you to join me in a moment of silent prayer. O Lord, guard and direct your church in the way of unity, service, and praise. For those charged with leading the church, especially Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Linda, our primate, Andrew and Kevin, our bishops, and the clergy and staff of this parish, and for all who bear witness to Christ in, the, in their lives, lay ministers, hospice and food bank volunteers, and caretakers, let us pray to the Lord. Give to all nations an awareness of the unity of the human family and bring an end to its conflicts. For those in authority, especially Queen Elizabeth, Justin, the Prime Minister, and the leaders of this province and city, and for all who make decisions about our common life in a time of public health crisis, let us pray to the Lord. Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness, and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right for the renewal of bonds of mutual respect between us and a sober recognition of those hurt by our exclusion, let us pray to the Lord. Teach us to use your creation for your greater praise, that all may share the good things you provide, for a just use of the earth's resources and prudence for stewarding the inheritance of future generations, let us pray to the Lord. Strengthen all who give their energy and skill to the healing of those who are sick in body or in mind, and bless all who care for the elderly and children, especially the staff of our own child care center. For those who are sick, and for those we remember before you now, Jennifer, Bob, Dolph, Herminia, Hans, Marshall, Maria, Catherine, Caitlin, Janice, Joe, Hunter, Philip, Grace, Janie, and Mark. Let us pray to the Lord. Grant a peaceful end and eternal rest to all who are dying and your comfort to those who mourn for the souls of the departed, for Marion, Tish, 
toward Philip and the children at the Kamloops Residential School and for those in whose memory the altar flowers are dedicated, Helen and Rodney Reed and James Reed, let us pray to the Lord. We give you thanks for all the blessings of this life, giving you particular thanks this day for the 60th anniversary of the wedding of Yvonne and Keith, and for all the many blessings you've bestowed upon us in this church and in this community. Let us pray to the Lord. Father of light, yours is the morning and yours the evening. Let Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine in our hearts and draw us to that light where you live in radiant glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. And 
may his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memorial of that most precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we must help you this each day, and grant that we receive these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. Who the same night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my God of the new Dhamma, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this, as all that you shall drink, in remembrance of me.
It's good to see you here, masked and vaccinated, and I see we're getting a few more each week, which is encouraging. Let me just take this moment to point to a particular pillar of this parish. Now, this parish has a number of pillars, but this one's a particularly solid one. And I want to just thank Yvonne Rudder who's been a part of this parish for 60 years. And uh, here she is. So thank you, Yvonne. You're here in rain, snow, sleet, hail, hurricane, and heat. And you're here, always here. And uh, we see that there was a wedding here on June the 10th, 1961, Christ Church on the Hill. And there is Yvonne and her husband, Keith. And uh, that's a a memorable moment in the history of this parish and in their lives. And we want to congratulate them on this milestone. All right. Thank you for your words this morning. Deacon Micah, a few more words. A few words. At 9 o'clock, I uh, had the opportunity to sit down with Daniel Hendrickson, who is the archivist here, and uh, he had all sorts of things to show me from the archives um, and the history of Grace Church on the Hill. So if you'd like to catch that, you can do so at 9 o'clock right here on the live stream um, or on our YouTube page, and uh, you'll get a chance to see uh, some of the items that are uh, even older than this building. So... Uh, Look forward to that, and then in weeks to come, we'll be having some conversations about the parables um, and more information to follow about that. And as you heard from Aaron Isles, our church warden last Sunday, we've begun on a narthex and courtyard renovation project this summer uh, so that when this pandemic is over and we're all vaccinated and back, uh, we can have a refreshed and rejuvenated place of worship and meeting. So let's hear for a moment from Chris Bunting, our senior warden. Thank you and good morning, everyone. You heard last week from my co-warden, Aaron Isles, all about our exciting Narthex Courtyard Renewal Project. I hope you enjoyed the video that visualizes what the improvements will look like. If you would like to see it again or share it with your family and friends, there's a link on the Grace Church website that will take you directly to it. This past week was a busy week on the project front. There was a big startup on-site meeting with the architects and landscape contractors to plan the project. 
Entrances and exits for the child care center during the construction period were also finalized. Hoarding around the site will go up on June the 14th or the 15th. The Thelma Avenue entrance will not be accessible during construction, so please remember there will be no parking lot in behind the church during that period. Also this past week, tests were conducted on the best ways to clean the brick walls outside without damaging them. A lot of people are going to be involved in the Narthex courtyard, courtyard renewal, and we will keep you apprised of progress throughout the time. On behalf of all of us, I'd like to say a special thank you to Aaron Isles, who is spearheading the project, Bob Davies, the lead architect, and Andy Duncanson, our fundraiser in chief. This is the biggest capital project Grace Church on the Hill has undertaken in almost 70 years. And we could not do it without the steady guidance and support of Canon Peter Walker and the clergy and Christopher Leonard and our staff. And can I add our collective thanks to our clergy and staff as well as our wonderful musicians and volunteers for continuing to bring us our virtual worship every week without fail. We can hardly wait for the day we can all gather together and welcome everyone to our fully accessible church. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher, and to all people of grace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.